everyone, welcome to Anthem Online. We are so excited for you to be worshiping with us this morning. Here with me is my husband, Josh, and we hope that you've had a good week this morning, but how has your week been, Josh? Uh, my week has been good. Yeah? It's been good. I had, family, you do? I had family from out of town. Okay. Came back, visited from Washington. We were hanging out, but I just have to say, Today was cold. Today was really cold. Literally Monday, 97 degrees, wow. 80 degrees. And what is this 50, 60 degrees? We're not used to it. No. We've adapted. No, I'm from Canada and I, I have to say that <laughs> it was probably warmer in Canada than it was here in California. Yeah, today. what is up with that? So that, that was wild. And hey, you know what? Maybe if you are part of our Canadian audience, <laughs> you know, we can rally together. Put in the comment section below if you are Canadian, if you're watching from Canada. Exactly, we wanna know who our com Canadian community is. And so comment below, message us, let us know who you are. We wanna say hey, and we wanna say A to you guys. Totally, and you know what? <laughs> we are super excited because we just launched into a brand new message series entitled The Advocate. Exactly, so The Advocate is where Pastor Randy is gonna journey through and really dig deep into the Word and how exactly the Holy Spirit interacts in our lives. So you don't wanna miss out on that. Another thing you do not wanna miss is this journey that we here at Anthem, we are on together. Whether you're watching Woo, yeah. online or you've been in a part of our in-person community, hey, we are just so thrilled that you are on this journey with us because we believe that God is gonna do big things exactly. here at Anthem. He's gonna do big things in your life and we want you to be on that journey with us. Exactly, and also like always, if you have something on your heart or on your mind that you'd like to give up to God, please let us know. Message us at this number down below and our prayer team is ready to pray for you. You are a part of our community and we want to love on you for that. So with that, we want to start worship this morning with a word from Psalms 95. And it says this, in his hands are the depth of the earth and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his as he made it and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. Let's worship together this morning.
come into your presence once again, we've gathered as a church uh, to simply give you the praise, to give you the glory. And together as a church, we, we sing together. We sing. Holy, there is no one like you. There is amazing that uh, Anthem has been going now for, I think this is week seven? Week seven outside? Yeah, that's exciting. We're, we weren't sure if we were going to make it, but we've made it this far. <laughs> um, it's pretty awesome that we move into this next phase of God's leading, which is finally moving into an even bigger vision, into this new space up here, and I believe that God is going to do amazing and wonderful things in this space up here. We want you to be a part of that journey with us. I believe that God is going to do a miracle because his spirit is here. It's moving with us. Uh, I believe he can do a miracle in your own life. Uh, we believe that Jesus is above all, that through his name he can break any chain. Amen? Amen. Let's declare that tonight.
Cause death could not hold you The veil tore before you You silenced the boast of sin Every voice the Sing this together. What a friend we have in Jesus. Oh, our sins and griefs to bear. How do you know if you have the Holy Spirit, the Advocate? How do you know if the Advocate's at work in your heart and life? It's an important question, especially when you begin to consider the landscape 
of people of Christian faith? Because the truth is there are many different answers to that question. For example, if you were to go to certain parts of the southeastern part of this country, you would find that when people came to the small church, as evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence, they would bring a box, and somewhere during a very active service, someone up front would open that box and would begin to extract rattlesnakes. You can see it on YouTube. Those rattlesnakes start waving their heads around as the people wave them around, their tongues slicing out into the air. It's an evidence, say the worshipers, of the Holy Spirit's presence. I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that that's not an evidence for you. So how do you know that the Holy Spirit's working in your life? About 30 years ago, more or less, there was something else that happened in Toronto. It drew a lot of attention, a great deal of interest. Many people were focused on it, talking about it, writing about it, and arguing about it. The ones who experienced it said it was an evidence of the presence of the Holy Spirit. It was called the Toronto Blessing. It was important enough, I want to read to you about it. Listen to these words describing the Toronto Blessing. The Toronto Blessing is a supposed outpouring of the Holy Spirit on the people of the Toronto Airport Christian Fellowship Church, formerly the Toronto Airport Vineyard Church. On January 20, 1994, a Pentecostal pastor named Randy Clark spoke at the church and gave his testimony of how he would get drunk in the spirit and laugh uncontrollably. In response to this testimony, the congregation erupted in a pandemonium with people laughing, growling, dancing, shaking, barking like dogs, and even being stuck in positions of paralysis. These experiences were attributed to the Holy Spirit entering people's bodies. The pastor of the church, John Arnott, referred to it as a big Holy Spirit party. The moniker Toronto Blessing was given, and the church was soon in the international spotlight. So what about it? Laughing uncontrollably? Barking like a dog? How do you know the Holy Spirit is present in your life? Again, I tend to doubt that that's the answer you would give. Many, many, many more of our Christian brothers and sisters in Christ would say that the evidence of the Holy Spirit's presence in your life is that you speak in tongues, meaning you speak in language that are not intelligible to other human beings. They draw from the book of Acts, they draw from the writings of Paul and give a scriptural basis for their experience. Again, probably many who are joining us in this worship service would say, that's not the evidence in my life. So how do you know the Holy Spirit is present in your life? Maybe a nuance on the gift of tongues. It's one that I wonder about very seriously. It has to do with languages that maybe weren't naturally learned or where gifting is evidence in an unusual way. My mother and father went to South America's missionaries. They went and studied Spanish intensively for six months. My mother had taken Spanish in high school, but you took Spanish in high school. How well do you speak it? <laughs> and my dad knew no Spanish. Six months they studied intensively, and then dad began to preach in Spanish and would preach for decades to come in that language. Now, you can talk to anyone who's learned Spanish in his or her adult life, and, and they will tell you that while you learn the language and while you master the vocabulary, the rolling of the R's is a problem for people who look like me and learn it in their adult years. In fact, there are sayings in Spanish to underline how the rolling of the R's is very important. El ferrocarril corre rápido. Those R's are rolled. Dad couldn't do that. He made it a special matter of prayer. I will tell you that throughout his adult life, he spoke Spanish without an accent, 
perfectly rolling his R's. If you had asked that, he would have told you that was the Holy Spirit's work in his life. So maybe that's one way to tell. Or you might say, I know the Holy Spirit's at work in my life because of what happens when I'm in a powerful worship service. You've worshiped God here with us at Anthem, and you have experienced the singing of the music, the prayer, the sharing of the word, and you have walked away saying, I experienced the Holy Spirit there. That's how I know the Holy Spirit is active in my life. How do you know the Holy Spirit is working in your life? It's an urgent question because it's one of the key realities about which Jesus spoke his last night on earth. Two days ago, just two days ago, just not many steps in that direction from where I am right now, the Christian writer Philip Yancey spoke at the Loma Linda University Church. He spoke to Loma Linda University health leaders. Part of his presentation was a part where he referred to this passage, this section of Scripture, which we have been considering. He said those chapters, John 13 to 17, where Jesus shares so deeply of his heart, he said, are very simple when you come down to the bottom line. Jesus doesn't share a mission statement trying to dismiss every word that's extraneous and trying to make it memorable. He doesn't talk about a grand strategic plan. He doesn't even give an idea for philanthropy and how to raise funds in order to, to pay for the plan that he's leaving his disciples. He does none of that. In fact, what he does is very simple. He says things like, love each other. Live in unity. Listen to and do what I say. Simple. But for all their simplicity, the disciples will require help. And that's why I would point us to saying, Jesus talks about the Advocate, the Holy Spirit that night, and we have to pay attention to what He says. Because if we're going to do what He's calling us to do, if we're going to love each other, if we're going to live in unity, if we're going to follow His commands for our lives, we will need help. And that comes in the form of the Advocate, the Holy Spirit. How do you know when you have the Holy Spirit in your life? I got a card just this last week from a woman who's part of our viewing community who is 103 years old. Now, when I get instructions from somebody who's 103 years old, I tend to listen because I fear they've lived a lot more life than I have. Well, this card came from Jane Peel. And here's what Jane Peel wrote to me. She said, Dear Randy, I'm so glad you're speaking on the Holy Spirit. I found this statement several years ago in a book by Ellen White. I will be 104 this summer, and I am experiencing this electric shock of the Holy Spirit. I'm so glad you're speaking on the Holy Spirit. Did I have to wait until I'm nearly dead to learn about this electric shock? It's true. I think I'm in heaven. If only our people knew about it, it's a whole new life for me. And then this is the quote she talked about. An electric shock is needed. Pray that the mighty energies of the Holy Spirit may fall like an electric shock on the palsy-stricken soul, causing every nerve to thrill with new life, restoring the whole person from his dead, earthly, sensual state to spiritual soundness. You will thus become partakers of the divine nature, and in your souls will be reflected the image of him by whose stripes you are healed. The electric shock of the Spirit, 103 years old. Now, doesn't that scare you just a little bit? If I'm honest, I have to tell you, it scares me some. I read about the Spirit of God in Scripture. I see the disagreements, the uncertainties of how to know the Spirit of God is working in our heart and lives by His Christ, by His followers, by Christ's followers today. And it scares me some. What will the Spirit want to do with me? What will the Spirit want to do in me? It's frightening. 
to surrender oneself completely to the work of the Spirit of God means I lose some control. What will the Spirit do with me? I read a story. I tried to trace it back to its origins. I didn't get all the way there, couldn't find it. So maybe you'll want to count it as a parable, though where it was written, the book in which I read it said it was a truthful story. Apparently published in a magazine in the eastern part of our country, it told the story of a woman getting into her car at night, beginning to drive, and of realizing that there was a large truck right behind her, right on her rear bumper. She sped up, it sped up. She slowed down, it slowed down. Her heart began to pound. She got increasingly afraid. She tried going through a Traffic light right at the last moment, the truck ran the red light, staying right on her. By now, she was in a panic. She finally saw up ahead a well-lit service station. She screeched into there, leaped out, and ran into the mart for protection. As she stopped and leaped out, the man in the truck behind her stopped and leaped out, raced up to her car, and pulled out a man from the back who from his vantage point, he could see hiding in the back of the car, a would-be attacker, a would-be rapist. She was running from the one who wanted to save her. I read that and I thought, that's kind of like me with the Spirit. I'm a bit afraid of what the Spirit's going to do. How do I know if the Spirit's working in my life? And so I tend to distance myself. So what do we do? Well, we're going to go to the passage in John's Gospel, John chapter 15, and we're going to read the passage. Now, we're going to read the overall section because I want us to get the context in which Jesus speaks the words, even though our primary focus is just two verses. But the, the section before those two verses as well as the section after those two verses both contain Jesus' statements saying, you're going to face difficult times, hardships, persecution. Life is not going to be easy. And he recognizes that because of that, they're going to need an advocate who will help them. So let's read first the section, John chapter 15. I'm going to start reading let me find my place here in verse 18. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. Remember that what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. They will treat you this way because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not be guilty of sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father as well. If I had not done among them the works no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin. As it is, they have seen, and yet they have hated both me and my Father. But this is to fulfill what is written in their law, they hated me without reason. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. All this I have told you so that you will not fall away. They will put you out of the synagogue. In fact, the time is coming when anyone who kills you will think they are offering a service to God. They will do such things because they have not known the Father or me. I have told you this so that when their time comes, you will remember that I warned you about them. So that's the section. Right at the heart of that section, it talks about the advocate. But before it, Jesus says, if you belong to me, then expect to be treated as they treated me. If they listen to me, they'll listen to you. If they hated me, they'll hate you. And then after he talks about the advocate, he says, I've told you these things so that you will know what to expect. I've told you these things so you won't fall away, so you won't be surprised when they happen. Now, with that reality in place, 
it's clear that they will need help. And that's those two verses at the heart of the passage. Let's reread those, John 15, 26 and 27. When the Advocate comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he will testify about me. And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. He will testify about me. The Greek word for testify is martyreo. It means to witness. It is a witness who is giving testimony about something important and profound. It's not a trite word. That, says Jesus, is the first thing the Spirit will do. The Holy Spirit, he says, when he comes, will testify about me. He will point people to me. He will lift my life up before people. He will highlight facets of my ministry, facets of my person. He will draw people to me. Last week on our afternoon Q&A, as we were talking about the work last week of the Helper, somebody chatted in to the Q&A and said, It seems to me like the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, are characterized by always pointing at each other. The Father points to the Son as the evidence of His love to the world. The Son points to the Father as being the one whose character He reveals. The Son promises the Spirit. The Spirit says, I'm going to point you back to the Son. They're all pointing to each other. And Jesus builds on that theme right here. He says, when the Spirit, when the Advocate comes, when the witness comes, He will witness about me. And so that question, that supremely important question, how do I know the Holy Spirit's in my life, is at work in my life, is answered by Jesus. Those things I shared at the beginning, some of them no doubt spurious, not evidence of the Holy Spirit. Others, yes, maybe evidences of the Holy Spirit. But they still leave many ordinary believers unable to answer with clarity the question, how do I know the Holy Spirit's working in my life? Here Jesus answers that. He says the first thing the Holy Spirit will do is he will be the first witness to me. You understand what that means? It means if you are drawn to Jesus, if you appreciate Jesus, if you enjoy reading about Jesus, learning about Jesus, if you are struck by the matchless charms of Christ, if you find a sense in your heart that you want to give your life to Him, if you have invited Him into your life, if you're walking with Him, Every one of those realities is an evidence that the Spirit is present in your life. Because when your life is focused on Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Just that, just that sentence. When your life is focused on Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. And the more deeply your life is centered in Jesus, the more clearly He comes into focus in your heart. The more deeply does the Holy Spirit have a grip on your life because the Holy Spirit points us to Jesus. He's the first witness for Jesus. When your life is focused on Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. It's just that simple. We don't need to make it more complicated than that. And maybe that's the reason why Ellen White says, when you get the Holy Spirit, you get every other blessing along with the Spirit. Every other blessing. Because that Spirit brings Jesus into focus in your life. And when Jesus is in focus in your life, everything else gets worked into its rightful place. 
Here's a quote I'd like to share with you, one that deeply resonates with me. I'm deeply struck by this statement made by Ellen White. Listen to these words. Of the disciples, after the transfiguration of Christ, it is written that at the close of that wonderful scene, they saw no man save Jesus only. Jesus only. In these words is contained the secret of the life and power that marked the history of the early church. When the disciples first heard the words of Christ, they felt their need of him. They sought, they found, they followed him. They were with him in the temple, at the table, on the mountainside, in the field. They were as pupils with a teacher, daily receiving from him lessons of eternal truth. Now, I hope you caught that sentence early in the quote. It's a sentence worth writing in your Bible and reading and rereading time and again. Here's the sentence again. Jesus only. In these words is contained the secret of the life and power that marked the history of the early church. Jesus only. When your life is characterized by Jesus only, of one thing you can be certain, you have the Holy Spirit. Because that's what the Spirit does. If you're afraid, driving as fast as you can away from that Spirit that pursues you, as the old writer said, like the holy hound of heaven, running for your life in fear, slow down. He's trying to save you. He merely wants to grip your heart, turn your eyes toward Jesus, and cause you to fall deeply, hopelessly, helply, helplessly in love with Jesus. When your life is focused on Jesus, you have the Holy Spirit. Now remember that those words were written about the early church, the church in the book of Acts, that book where the Holy Spirit is so abundantly present, that book where the Holy Spirit is the center stage actor, where the Holy Spirit is leading and guiding in everything that happens, that book that starts as a tiny Jewish sect, an enclave in Jerusalem, and by the end of the book, it has gone to the ends of the then known world. What has happened? The Holy Spirit happened. How did that happen? the Holy Spirit reminded them of two words, Jesus only. That's how you know you have the Holy Spirit. But, but, you remember our passage. You remember those words in John 15 where he says, I'm going to send you the Spirit from the Father, the Spirit of truth. He says this, last part of verse 26, He will testify about me. That's what we've just been talking about. And then he says this, And you also must testify, for you have been with me from the beginning. You also must testify, Jesus says. The Holy Spirit is the first witness. You are the second. The Holy Spirit is the first witness. You are the second. It's something called the divine initiative. It's a phrase scholars use to describe the fact that God always makes the first step, always makes the first move, always acts first. In fact, God is always present working through the Spirit before we ever get there. If we show up in somebody's life and we think we're going to share the Spirit with them, we're going to share Jesus with them, just count on the fact that Jesus has already been there. He's been there through His Holy Spirit. And that's true here. The Holy Spirit is the first witness. He brings Jesus into focus. You're the second witness. You may be the one who actually invites someone to surrender to Jesus. I'm struck by the words of the late A.W. Tozer, who in talking about the Holy Spirit's work in the early church said, in the early church, the Holy Spirit was responsible for 95% of what happened. And if the Holy Spirit had disappeared, everything would have been affected. Then he says, 
In the modern day church, we're responsible for about 95% of what happens. We're not depending on the Spirit, and if the Spirit disappeared, no one would notice. Those are sobering words. The reality of the importance of the Spirit who gets there first, but also the importance we have in being the second witness. In fact, William Temple, the bishop, said, Where there is no Spirit flowing forth from us, there's no Spirit in us. Because when the Spirit is in us, the Spirit flows from us. It's unavoidable. And that's what Jesus is telling his disciples here. He's saying, you've been with me all along. You know me. You have walked with me. Now you must be the second witness. And he says that to us as well. There may be someone in your life. There are people in my life of whom this is true. There may be someone in your life that you have felt a desire to share about Jesus with, talk about Jesus. A roommate, a colleague, fellow classmate. But it's, honestly, it's scary. You think, if I raise this, they, they, they may push back strongly against it. I remember a man in my life, I was a young adult, working in construction, trying to work my way through college. And this particular man, well, he... he, he he was everything that I was sure the Spirit didn't participate in. Cursing, swearing, drinking, partying, womanizing, everything. And very out there about it. I didn't see him for a while. And then one evening he came over to where I was living at the time and something had happened. I can see it in my mind's eye. Him sitting there across from me in the living room of the place where I lived, sitting there talking about Jesus, about what Jesus had done for him, how Jesus had changed him, given him peace, forgiveness, power. And I sat there thinking, what in the world? What happened? Well, the Spirit happened, and because I was too scared, I missed my opportunity to be the second witness in inviting him. That's what Jesus says. Spirit is the first witness. You can be the second. You can invite Richard Stearns, the president emeritus of World Vision, talks about it as the domino theory. You've seen those dominoes when they're lined up and you tip the first domino over. They knock all the other dominoes down, sometimes hundreds, sometimes thousands, sometimes 10,000 of them. He says, that's like this is. Jesus had 12 dominoes at the beginning, disciples into whom he poured his life, and then he tipped them. And those disciples tipped other dominoes, and those dominoes, other dominoes. And it became a worldwide movement, starting with 12, now numbering over 2 billion on the planet. That's a lot of dominoes. And then he shares the story of one domino. A young man who wanted to be a missionary, in fact, made a commitment to be a missionary. Turned out, though, that he was too frail, too sickly, wasn't able to go. But he began to work in this country, and he began to urge others to commit themselves to sharing the gospel of Jesus with the world. A young man heard him one day named Samuel Moffat. He took him up on it. Moffat ended up going to Korea. And there in Korea, he met with a young man named Kiel Sun Chu. And Kiel became another domino. And then Kiel in his country began to knock over other dominoes as others came to Christ. Till by the time he died in 1935, 5,000 people attended his funeral. And those 5,000 and others were dominoes that continued to be knocked over. 
all the way up until the time when Richard Stearns wrote this in 2011, there were 15 million Christ followers in South Korea. All because of that first domino that got tipped over. The Holy Spirit bringing Jesus into focus in somebody's life and then that person becoming the second witness to Jesus in someone else's life. I want to read you the words of Richard Stearns. Listen to what he says about this. He writes, as Christians, we're all dominoes in the chain reaction set off by Jesus 2,000 years ago. The amazing thing about dominoes falling is that the chain reaction always starts small with just one seemingly insignificant domino. Whether you are sponsoring children, filling backpacks for children in inner city schools, talking to your own children, or praying earnestly for people around the globe, you have no idea how big the impact will be as God multiplies your faithfulness. And it is all done in the power of the Spirit. So how do you know when the Holy Spirit is active in your life? Well, Jesus tells us. When Jesus is the focus of your life, you have the Holy Spirit. And when you have the Holy Spirit, you become the second witness. There's someone in your life that needs your witness, that needs you to share words about Jesus that needs to know that there's someone else that cares about their spirit and soul. If you want to make a difference in their life, ask God to fill you with the Holy Spirit, with the witness. Because when he does, the Spirit will bring Jesus into focus in your life. And when Jesus is in focus in your life, you will become the second witness and the domino tips will begin. We will put our lives on his foundation.
that was an amazing message by Pastor Randy, and yeah. we are so glad that you could join with us today online. And hey, you know what? Uh, here at Anthem, what happens, what you see take place takes a lot of behind the scenes. Exactly. It takes a lot of work, a lot of production, and a lot of resources. If you've been enjoying each week being a part of the Anthem community online, then we would love to partner with you uh, financially. We would love yeah. if you would help us support if you would uh, help us to keep this ministry going so that we can continue to do this each and every week. So you can go ahead and text 77977. That's the number you'll text. And you can text LLUC to that number. You'll be given a link where you'll be directed to be able to give directly to Anthem. Or you can go direct to the website, LLUC.org slash give, where you're also be able to support Anthem as well. Exactly. Yes. And we want to challenge you with something before we go. Sometime this week, I know we have busy lives and stuff can get away. Uh, we have work. We have children. Oh, my goodness. So many things. And uh, we want to challenge you. Do something for yourself this week. Self-care is so important. We want to make sure that you guys are taking care of yourselves. So one act this week of self-care. Do something fun this week something pleasurable for you and we'll see a uh, comment down below what you're gonna do that'll be exciting to kind of yeah. see what people do it's so easy to not remember to do something fun during the week and that can also just be a stress reliever as well um, and like always follow us on social media um, we are on Instagram Facebook and you know you can always go to the luc.org website to find out more info about Anthem and with that being said we hope that you were blessed being a part of the Anthem community this yes. weekend. We hope that you'll continue to journey with us. That's we right. hope that you have an incredible week ahead of you. God is going to move in big ways. We love you, and we'll see you next time. See you next week.